Okay, so welcome back again to the, the code, uh, code Maven Programming Bootcamp. Um, I got, my name is still Gabor Sabu and Nora is still with me. And uh, hi. yeah, hi. And um, we were discussing uh, previously the, the exercise that this basically this is the fir first exercise to do um, that uh, um, just to make sure that your environment is working to download the the, the editor uh, to download Python, uh, Anaconda, or uh, from elsewhere, elsewhere, and um, and write this Hello World, world program, program. Now you said that um, you, you you might have some uh, questions. So yeah, so um, I had a couple of questions about different interpreters and different um, notes. No, like different uh, text editors like Notepad. So with the previous course, uh, they advised us to download the text editor Atom. Yeah. And we also were using, uh, we, we weren't using Anaconda, we were using just the, the basic Python um, interpreter. Um, so I was just gonna ask if you have any recommendations, which one to use, or if there is any issue, if, if uh, both are, download it or both are running on the same computer so uh right so uh, as as i said it's basically especially with the editor okay it's not exactly what i said but it's basically up to you whatever editor you use uh, there are a couple of things that I, i'm going to mention about this uh, in a second but uh, specifically about atom if you like it then then it's more or less similar i think than as as uh, um, Notepad++ plus plus, uh, to the to the point um, that to the, related to the point that I, I wanted to make. Uh, so if you're already familiar with Atom, then just use it. Um, um, but um, I used it uh, a couple of years ago, and then, then it was quite at the beginning when it was uh, it existed, and I didn't like it that much. I don't even remember what I wrote in it, whether it was Python or something else. Um, it was like I don't know many years ago, um, and um, and nowadays I, I use different uh, other editors usually. So what I use is either well, I, personally I use Vi Vim uh, usually because I run most most of the time I use Linux when I work. So now I'm using Windows for the presentation so I can show things on Windows. But uh, almost all the other time I use Linux uh, for my work. Um, as an IDE, I also use uh, many times PyCharm, which is a super powerful IDE, especially for Python. That's it's called PyCharm. Um, it's a bit heavy, so it's, it takes uh, resources. Uh, but um, once you get used to all these, and it, it's very powerful, and lots of lots of things it has. And once you get used to it, it's it's very nice. It has really really powerful features, but it ha it has its own learning curve, and especially at this point so at one point i'm going to show you how to use it but at this point i want to make sure that you're uh, you're familiar with the, the separation of editor and then switching to a to a com command line and running your code there and not from the editor because i think it's important um, it's maybe less comfortable at this point but it's uh, it's uh, important um, the other editor ide that people also recommend that i also use though less for Python is Visual Code of Microsoft, um, which is a free editor. <clears throat> and it's, I think it's, uh, it's basically the same technology as Atom used. So in, a, in many ways, it's very similar. I don't know if there has any code base, shared code base there or not, but uh, a lot of things are, are similar. Uh, and uh, many people say that it's like super powerful editor and uh, super, super good. I like it as well. I write, uh, Go program in it, uh, Golang programs, uh, less so Python, um, but that's another uh, tool. Um, and um, if you are still on, uh, about the editors and IDEs, I didn't mention at the beginning, but I, probably I should, that there is something called um, a Spider uh, that comes with, uh, that can be installed, and then it also comes with Anaconda, and it's a nice environment to for some interactive editing of Python, and we can look at it, but at this point, I definitely don't recommend that you use it. Okay, so I know that 
in many people in my courses they encounter it or they have already seen it by other people at this point i would prefer that you don't use it later on you can get back to it but because it's, it has a different mode of working uh, than uh, editing uh, programming uh, editing running editing running it has uh, so at this point I, I would recommend not to there's also a jupyter notebook which is very powerful in this very useful uh, i see it especially in the data science among people doing data science they're using it a lot it's an, another interactive way to write python programs we'll look at them look at uh, this uh, it's especially good when you have loads of data so you have a lot of data that you would like you need to remove real um, load into the memory and then do all kind of things on it while you're still writing your program uh, but then at the end uh, you won't want to run your program in jupyter notebook usually at the end um, unless it's a like a one-time program so many researchers that's what they do they write some one-time program that they, they calculate something and then that, that's it um, or let's say, or at least that's what they tell us themselves. Uh, in the end, they have to turn it into something that runs many times. Uh, for example, that's what I, I, you might do an experiment, okay? And the experiment results in the end some Excel file. And then you do a lot of scientific work trying to figure out what, how to represent that data, what to, how to analyze that data. And that part you will probably you do in Jupyter Notebook because it's easier, okay? But then you will do, uh, you will have the same research done or same experiment done hundreds more times and you will get exactly the same type of data, of course, different values, but the same layout of the data. And now you would like to do this exact same process that you have already figured out what to do. Okay, so now you're not trying to figure it out. You are trying to run the same process and create the exact same type of graphs or images or whatever from the new set of data. And that you don't want to do it in Jupyter Notebook. That you want to do it in a command line script or at least some, something that everything is closed. So you just select the file and you run it or even go to the point where it's a command line script and it's a nightly job that everything runs automatically and all, all you have to do is get an email with all the results. Okay, so that's different, but that's Jupyter Notebook. And then um, what else do we have here that we want? No, that's, that's the editor part, okay? So, but for now, some simple editor and Atom but can be good. Now the question whether uh, Anaconda Python or Python from the from the website of Python.org. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Python on Windows was uh, not really good. Uh, the Python that came out from the Python community, and that's where Anaconda came in, and it was really good rep rep uh, good distribution, especially for Windows. Uh, the, the main problem was actually that uh, not so much with Python itself, but installing all kind of these third party tools, third party libraries that could do the various data analysis. And um, it got way better now. So maybe the difference is not that much. So maybe it's okay to use uh, for the complex stuff as well. For the first uh, couple of weeks, it doesn't really matter. So until we get to some really, until we would like to use some really, really special library, that's you, uh, until then, uh, what, what you get with, with uh, the default installation of Python, or not default, the, the standard in installation of Python is, is definitely good enough. And, I ha and maybe later on as well, I don't know. I haven't tried it, okay? Um, the only, only thing is that having two, two installations of Python can be problematic on, especially on Windows, not, not so much on Linux uh, and uh, on Mac. On Windows, it can be more problematic because the way Windows works, and especially it can be problematic if you, your editor, for example, sees one version of Python 
installed and then when you switch to the command window to the where you execute that there actually you access the other python and then uh, um, if the versions are not very different then the only problem might be that in one place you install something and in the other place now you don't have that install it, that, that extra third party module okay so that could be the the, the issue so i wouldn't especially on windows i would have only one one ver one python installed okay um, later on <clears throat> so i don't especially when you're beginning uh, to use python later on when you're already an expert in this then feel free to have it then then you then you will be able to get out of the mess that this might create but as long as you're especially when you're a beginner it's a pity to to get into that kind of mess if you have enough mess it's writing code okay so yeah okay any more questions about about this no i think i think that was all okay good but if you are just feel free to ask questions okay um as i usually try to to tell uh, people in in my training courses uh, they are afraid of us wait a second um something uh this part okay uh, <clears throat> when they're sometimes they're afraid of asking questions and i'm just telling them okay when you ask the question then it's probably because other people also wanted to ask the question so you're just doing them a favor so that's basically um okay so <clears throat> let's go on and i still have a, I, I see i just went ahead of the slides and still see that i still have a lot of this theoretical part of it so if you're if you are lucky enough and watching the video and not <laughs> and, uh, seeing it live then feel free to to skip ahead if if uh, you're not interested in this right now and start doing the programming part and then but 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 especially if you're new to programming then i would really recommend that you come back and later view it so you have a, a deeper understanding of, of, of what you're doing or what we are doing here so <clears throat> uh, let's talk a little bit of what is programming actually okay so <clears throat> uh, basically we would like to tell the, the uh, your screen is not shared now oh that's something that i usually do thank you for <laughs> no worries right yeah that happens to me often. So yeah, we were in the exercise. So just everyone that can see, and um, and then we are doing uh, talking about what is programming. <clears throat> okay. So it's much better now that uh, if for nothing else, that for that you, you told me this because otherwise I would be talking like an hour for you. And uh, yeah, good. So what is programming? So we would like to use. So we we. Okay, we would like to tell the computer to do something, okay? Ideally, we would speak in our mother tongue, okay? So we'd speak in Hungarian or English or whatever language you, your, your mother tongue is or the, mo the language that you're most comfortable with in the, your, let's say, the, your scientific environment, okay? You would like to use that language and just tell the computer what to do. The problem is that um, um, we, the programmer world couldn't write some program that would understand like free text free english text let's say and uh, be able to uh, tell the computer what to do and translate it to the computer we see even nowadays we see all these uh, um, uh, experiments basically we need all these translating tools and we see how many mistakes they make okay when trying to translate free text so we, we're still not there. We're really still really far, far from there uh, to, to be able to do that. So instead of that, people invented much smaller languages. These are like Python and C and all Java and all these, these are programming languages, which are much smaller languages, uh, but uh, that uh, with the languages that anything that's written in these languages can be translated to the computer that's basically and they have a really really strict syntax so unlike uh, uh, and it's really uh, uh, grammar so unlike in english when now i'm speaking and i'm sure that i'm making lots of lots of grammatical mistakes but most people will understand it because most people understand are intelligent enough to understand this the, the the mistakes and get over it that i made a mistake okay 
And this is where they, they, they call it artificial intelligence, that the computer is supposed to understand all these things. But we are really, really far from, from really understanding it well and being able to rely on it. So instead of that, when you write a program, it has to be really, really strict in what you, you do. So if you make a punctuational mistake, you put a dot somewhere that you shouldn't, or you, you don't put, or that's, that can make your program to not work or do something else than what you, you meant. In Python, it's, it's as extreme that even spaces uh, uh, matter. So if you don't put the, the right amount of spaces in specific locations, uh, then your program won't work. Or if you do a, a wrong amount of spaces, then your program might do different things than you actually meant. So these really small things are, are uh, important. Okay, so but let's get back to what is programming. So in programming, we'd like to tell something to the computer to do, and it's basically like a, a cooking recipe, okay? So you need to do the step, step and step, step by step instructions of telling the computer what to do, okay? So if I, if I give you an example and I tell you to, uh, I go to a restaurant and, and tell the, the waiter that I would like to have a spaghetti bolognese, um, they know what to do, okay? They know exactly how to do. If you tell me the same things, I have no idea, okay? You, you have to tell me exactly, okay, take, uh, so you would maybe say, okay, uh, make some pasta and make some sauce and that's be done. Okay, but I have no idea how to make pasta, okay? And you have to go really, really to small steps of you to take the pot, this pot, not, not just any pot, okay? Put water in it. So we, we have to be really, really specific uh, because I don't know how to, how to uh, do these abstract operations. So when you're writing programming, it's, it's quite similar. You have to take a complex, prog uh, a complex thing that you would like it to do, and you have to break it down into small parts that the computer can already understand, okay? And that's it. So it's not, it's not really a, any deep science in the end. You just have to be able to take things apart and, um, and understand that the, the computer in the end, it doesn't understand much. It just understand these, these uh, small uh, commands. So sometimes I, I, I tell people that uh, uh, try to think about uh, a five-year-old kid who can basically do anything. You just have to tell that kid uh, the exact steps. Um, and uh, at this point, I usually lose a lot of people when I say this. But anyway, so you have just to have some mental model of, 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 of doing this. OK, so back to the programming languages. That's what uh, I started to say that uh, earlier is that you would prefer to write in English, but it's too ambiguous when you write in English. Uh, same words mean different meaning, different things, and, and whatnot. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the computer understands ones and zeros. So I wouldn't want to write in ones and zeros to tell something to the computer, but because it would be really, really difficult. So we, we need this middle, this middle ground. Okay. Um, and in the end, the computer programs consist of numbers, like, like for example, thirty-seven. Just I have this example: is to put some data from here to there. But I don't want to type in these 37s. I used to do this, okay? Even back then it had names, these 37s, these really, really small commands. But I don't want to do this. I would like to go as close to the human language as possible, okay? As possible currently. And so that's one of the wins of Python that is relatively one of the closest, one of the languages that's relatively close to human language, okay? Um, <clears throat> so back to this comparison. So a human language has like words and punctuations, question marks and stuff, and the grammar and all kind of other things that uh, people who understand, uh, who are language scientists, whatever linguists, right? They understand even better. You know, they understand it, and I don't. Uh, and then compared to that, a programming language has built-in words. Okay, so for example, we saw print. Okay, uh, that would print something to the screen. Len, that would give me the length of something. Type, that would give me the type of something. So this is, uh, these are keywords in Python. 
Other programming languages have different keywords with different meanings, okay? Then there are what we call literal values, okay? Uh, these are usually numbers and strings. So a string is just a, a set of letters, okay? So, uh, okay, so <clears throat> a number, you know what, we, we usually know what a number is. So like it consists of digits, sometimes it has a dot in them, uh, and, and, um, because of decimal, decimal point, but basically these are numbers. Anything else we write is called a string, okay? So any text, anything else is called a string. Then languages and specific, specifically Python have operators uh, like um, plus and, and minus and, uh, and star to multiply things and comma and um, semicolon and things like this. And then there is the grammar, which I said uh, is usually called syntax in programming languages. And then there can be user created words. So we can combine the words, create what we call functions, which basically new words that you can later use in your program. Okay. Um, so you, we, we have the lower low level building blocks and then we can create bigger building blocks and then use them and then we create even bigger ones. And these we, we call it, this is, we also usually call abstraction. Okay. So, we have the, instead of using all the time the low, low level building blocks, we can use these higher level ones. So for example, we have a, um, we can create a function, which in the, in the end is just a keyword, a new keyword that uh, will <clears throat> give me the Fibonacci series. Okay. And then from that point, I don't need to go and do that every time. We can uh, use that keyword or whatever, thing you would let me to calculate. And that's what I, I told you. Okay, now I, I have a couple of nice examples here. Uh, the let's eat grandpa and the let's eat grandpa. Okay, so even in English, if a comma can have a meaning, can have a, a, a really important uh, change of meaning. Okay, um, in programming languages, it's even, it's much worse in the end. Um, so on one hand, they are, much smaller languages, tens of words, that's it. Uh, very strict grammar, very strict uh, syntax. So you can't just do something. Um, you, yeah, so you, but the, the advantage in programming languages is that you get feedback really, really fast and usually quite good. So when you're speaking and you're, let's say you're learning a language and uh, if the other person was correcting you every mistake you make, you wouldn't have be able to have a conversation. So they don't correct you. So they, you learn slower, right? In programming languages, you make any mistake, programming, uh, the, the, the compiler basically tells you, no, 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 you can't do this, okay? Um, and then you learn much faster. It's a lot more frustrating in a way because anything you do, it immediately tells you not, not it's not good, but, um, but eventually you learn very fast the, the rules and, and then, um, then at least some of the frustration goes, goes away. Um, literal values that I, I mentioned. So uh, there are what we call literal values is like the number 23 or 3.14 or the string hello that's in quotation marks. Okay, so everything which is not a number in Python, but almost everything needs to be in quotations. Whatever is in quotes is called a string, okay? And in these examples, I see I use double quotes all the time, but you could also use single quote. It doesn't matter for Python, okay? Um, and I usually mix them and so some people- So you don't, need to, you don't need to be consistent with them? You don't need to be consistent, uh, but some people will just shoot you if you don't, if you are not, <laughs> okay? So, uh, some people are really, really get really annoyed and uh, I can understand it that it, it's confusing, but in other languages and uh, in other languages, uh, the double quotes and the single quotes have different meaning. And um, so for that reason, I got to used to a little bit writing different ones. Um, but uh, so some people really, really like to stick to be, be consistent. 
I, I can't do, I, I, I couldn't get to, get to myself to do this yet, okay? Um, so you can see these are numbers. And what I do here is call the type function, remember I mentioned it, and I print out what the type function gives me. So the type function gives me here int. It tells me that this thing is of type integer. It's an integer number. Okay, 3.14, I ask what is the type, and then I print out the, the basically, so the type function basically gives me a string, returns me a string all the, all the time. So the int or the float or the str, these are the strings, and then I just print it out. Okay, so what I what I, you can see here is that you can you you uh, yeah, I um so 23 is an integer, well it's int, but it's an integer number. 3.14 is a floating point number, so that's right. I, I don't know, it's a decimal number, right? Um, uh, no, no, sorry, it's 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 a floating point number, so it has a dot in it. That's basically the point. Uh, this you see the hello is a string, so it's str. Now I can put 23 into, into quotes, and then Python will see that's an str, that's a string, okay? And Python will behave differently with the string than with the number 23, okay? Also 3.24, I could put, no idea why I changed for 14. Uh, I put quotations around this one, and it's still, then, then it's a string, okay? And it's different from the number 3.14. Well, it's definitely different, but, Okay, so even if I didn't have this mistake. Uh, okay, then there are, there are a couple of these special keywords in Python, none, true, and false. None, uh, where you don't, so it's a keyword, and uh, you can see in this uh, slide, they are colored with, in reddish something. You don't have quotations around it, so they are not strings. They are special signs. None means I have no clue, okay? So, um, but scientists understand that you have all kinds of data sets and there's some missing data. So how do you represent that? In Python, you would represent that missing data as none. You don't have an empty string there. You don't have a zero number there. You say none because you don't, you don't have the value there, right? Um, and of course, yes, there are other cases when you say that uh, uh, I just represent it with a zero or whatever, but that's, what, that's already your decision how to interpret something that's not there, okay? So in, in Python, you can represent the thing that, okay, I have no clue what's there, or it's missing or something and it's none. There's also true and false, which represent being something true or being something false. And we'll get into that later, but just to, so you can see the none is called none type, the type of, its type and the true and false, they are Boolean types. And these are the only two Boolean values in, in Python. And then there are more complex uh, data structures. So the empty, so if you put two square brackets, whatever is inside is called a list. It can be also empty as you can see it in this slide, but it's a list. It's a data structure in Python that can hold many, many pieces of data. There's another one called dict, which is short for dictionary. Okay, it's a pair of curly braces. And there's a couple of others that we don't go, I just wanted to show examples here. So these are different types in Python. Okay, um, and then, uh, okay, what happens if I say type and hello without quotation marks? The Python would think that hello is now a keyword, but Python doesn't have a built-in keyword called hello. Okay, and it, in this example, I don't have a, I didn't create my own keyword called hello. I didn't create a function or a variable, which is hello. So therefore, Python say, will give me, if I run this code, it will give me an error, saying name error, name hello is not defined. Basically, this just will stop at this point, okay? And uh, I have this still running, so you can, when I run this, okay, I'm missing the output. Oh, I'm going to run, show it now, okay? So let's, let's go to the examples, basic show types. So I'm switching to the Anaconda prompt, 
and I go to it's actually in uh, right now for me it's uh, in this directory so you can see I I can I don't have to see the one by one the directories I can um, um, create the whole directory path work and then slides okay so now I got into the place where I have all the slides downloaded so here I get into the Python directory and now if you look at this so this is the examples basic and show types so I, I can now I can actually write here Python examples basics and I forgot show types show types okay so this is the script so I don't have to change directory into the directory I could also execute it remote uh, from a distance but I have to give the relative pass to it so now I run it and this is what I get oh so I guess that I have a bug in the slide uh, hiding these uh, these characters so this is the output it prints out the names of the types okay here but instead of uh, oh no the, the, the so instead of um, so here I all, only show the name of the type uh, in reality it, it prints out something a little bit more doesn't really matter uh, it's still showing the, the int but what you can see that after it printed the dict okay so after this one this line it we got this name error exception so this is what we got what i have on the slide is just the last line what python actually uh, printed is this a little bit more and and uh, i get to this uh, this point and it didn't print the still running part and that's what one of the reasons i put it here so you can see that when you when there is what we call an exception okay so it's something which is also called a runtime error so the program is already running and then suddenly there is some error that the, the program can't do okay so python encountered here something that he doesn't know what to do with it okay um, sometimes python can tell things like this up front so it won't even start these are those are called compile time errors and sometimes python can only recognize that there is some problem here when it's already running and these are called runtime errors or runtime exceptions okay um, the important thing actually here or one of the important things is that um, if you encounter some an, er an exception like this okay uh, you in in this case it's really short only four lines but if it was a bigger program with functions functions calling functions at each other then it, it will be much longer this error will be much much longer but the point here is if you encounter such error you need to read it from the bottom up because the last one it says what is the actual error and then it says where did you have it line 15 okay and then if it's longer it tells you who called that and if it's even longer then it says who called that so how did you get there but when you when you try to understand what the error is best is to read the last line read it well uh, i see many people who just say oh there is an error and then run back and change something in the code without actually reading what the what the problem is and where the problem was found and that they, they just make further mess they they don't uh, understand these things and these things can can be actually understood at the beginning it be a, it might be a bit, little bit difficult but can be understood and uh, do you have any questions here up till here so this is a good opportunity actually to show you oh i don't know how do i copy paste here in windows i forgot i think this is how i copy and now i open uh, a new window yeah so i pasted this and uh, so i i try to show you okay so from the error message the hello is actually basically private to my problem all the rest is a general thing okay so if uh, 
um, the hello it comes from my problem that the rest is is uh, general so maybe i should remove this when i'm so searching because that just confuses uh, the the same but uh, apparently others have the same problem with the word hello so let's try to see this one what happens and this is on stack overflow okay so good opportunity to show you stack overflow so i searched for something the first hit basically came from stack overflow because apparently someone already asked this question actually this person already asked it and then someone else already asked earlier so someone later uh, marked it as a duplicate uh, question um, <clears throat> but um, so let's let's actually follow uh, yeah let's actually follow now this time the, the one that uh, is referred to so someone asked this question but someone already asked it and uh, there is the answer so this is the question at the top okay and then some quick comments on it sometimes this contained uh, some answer and then here are the answers so there are 14 answers now you can upvote or people who are registered to uh, stack overflow can upvote the answers and what uh, um, stack overflow does is put the most upvoted uh, one to the top so if you scroll down you will see other answers that uh, were liked less by people so probably you just need the first one you don't need to go down okay i usually also i mean sometimes i read the actual question sometimes i don't even read this i just look at the answer okay but sometimes it's good to actually read if the question is really what you also had or maybe it's some totally different thing and then it's not really relevant to you but then i come here and then uh, well too long didn't read okay so this is the answer um and then you can have uh, all kind of explanations here actually you can see that there's a python 2.7 issue python so i don't know if it's exactly related to what what we what we have but um but that's basically how you how you search now sometimes you will see uh, above the most upvoted answer you might see another one with a green v sign or whatever sign it's like a, a mark i don't see it here uh, that's uh, because the person who asked the original question can decide that to accept one of the answers as the right answer but maybe some other answer got more votes so i think that the standard way that stack overflow does is first it shows uh, the accepted answer and then the most popular one so maybe it's different maybe the to the person who asked the question that was the right answer but for the general population the other one is more is better or it's just a timing question the person already accepted one answer and then an even better came and the, the original person who asked the question didn't bother to change the the accepted vote. so it's good to, to look at both of them okay um but that's basically it and then you can you get all kind of things like this is the person who asked it then other people can edit actually the question itself you know, for typos or whatever fixes so in, in many times uh, the question the original question is being changed actually to cleaned up or whatever these quick answers might help so this is usually also like uh, quick answers or questions and then here down come come the answers okay uh, so back to our, our, our place here uh, yeah that's it basically so uh, what i what i have what i have here is a string must be enclosed in quotes and the numbers must not not be enclosed in quotes quotes okay uh and it, because once you put them in quotes then they become strings okay and um, then python will behave with them differently okay and that actually brings me to something more general again 
So it depending, it, environment depends on programming languages. For example, Perl is even more forgiving than Python and automatically converts the, the strings 23 to the number 23. Uh, that freaks out even pro Python programmers. But uh, most languages are much more stri much, much stricter. And uh, uh, in other languages, you would have a float 16 and four float 32. So it's different sizes of floating point numbers. In Python, you just have one float. Okay, which is just any float or integer, just any integer. In other languages, you would have a much more fine tuned of this type, of type system. So it's just different languages have different levels of strictness in, in their typing system. Um, I think we are, yeah, okay. There is two more slides and then uh, I think we'll stop this uh, session for now, okay? Uh, so one of them is the, the floating point issue that exists in basically every programming language. So the computer cannot really represent uh, a floating point number, okay? I mean, even in writing, you can't write down, if you divide one by three, you get a number that you can't actually write down on paper because it's an un, um, unlimited number of threes, right? So you can't even, now the same way computer cannot really represent numbers exactly, floating point numbers. It can represent uh, integers, but it can't uh, uh, represent floating point numbers. So for example, if you have this expression, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, the result will be this, which is almost right, okay? And, uh, uh, for most computation, it doesn't matter, okay? For chemists, it might, I don't know, okay? <laughs> so- uh, then, wait, I, can, I can see that there is a four at the end. Is that yeah. intentional or- No, that's, a, that's, the, that's, 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 that's the mistake. So right. computer, computer cannot make, doesn't know how to exactly represent these values. Right. When it adds them up, it's, it makes a mistake. And, uh, and, in floating point calculations, it can happen a lot, okay? But I mean, it's a, it's a small mistake, right? It's how many digits, a lot of digits here, like 10 or 15, or I don't know. And for mo most of the computations, it really doesn't matter, okay? I remember when, I, when, I, when in high school, we were learning physics and they said, well, sinus X, that is just one, who cares, okay? And that's when I freaked out from physics, but uh, that's a separate story. Um, so there, they just said sinus doesn't matter, or sinus doesn't matter, it's just one. For most programs, these this issues are, doesn't matter because you don't care more than two digits beyond the decimal point. If you are trying to calculate a rocket arriving to the Mars, then probably this matters, okay? Because this, this level of error would send you to the other direction of the galaxy, okay? So, weird other place. So it depends what you do. And obviously you wouldn't do this in, 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 in Python or not in these, these ways, okay? So just have to be careful with, with this and remember that floating points are not exact in, in program, in general programming languages. And then one other thing that I would like to, to talk about uh, before we take a break again is uh, NumPy. So I don't know, you have, you have heard about it, but NumPy is an extension, basically, let's say an extension, a library. We also call them module, uh, but it's a, it's a third party extension. You can think about that way of Python that can do all kinds of very fast numerical calculations with matrices, matrices, whatever it's in English. Okay, with vectors and matrices. Okay. Matrices. Matrices, thank you very much. Okay, at least one of us knows English. Um, so uh, NumPy, we're not going to talk about NumPy at the beginning of the course, okay? At the first couple of hours or whatever. Uh, at one point we get there and then we, we talk about NumPy as well, because that's, well, that's, where, that's why scientific people come to this course, because they want to use NumPy. 
So maybe I should show it and maybe we'll, we'll see it a little bit uh, sooner and then we get the, uh, much deeper into NumPy later on. Uh, the point is that NumPy, uh, Python alone can't do fast computation on lots of lots of numbers. That's not what it designed, what was designed for. In order to do that, you need to install this extra library called NumPy and Anaconda actually comes with it. So that's one of the advantages that you don't have to deal with the inter installation. <clears throat> and then uh, it's just more Python code from, from your point of view, it's just more Python code, okay? But it's in the end, it's the library called NumPy. And the interesting part related to what we just discussed is that NumPy itself has this really, really strong typing system. So in NumPy, you have this, you can put a value into an int eight something location or an int 32 location. And the number here, eight and 32, means how many bits it uses in the memory. So now, Okay, so the computers are built up of zeros and ones. Each, each thing that is a zero or one is called a bit. And then uh, if you remember that you downloaded the software which was 32 bit or 64 bit, it depends how, how the computer itself handles things. So it uses 32 bit or 64 bit. Uh, here, what we are saying is that we're allocating eight bits to, to, to store an integer or 32 bits to store an integer, okay? So here we are very, very specific with NumPy, um, which gives, which is on one hand is a headache because now you have to decide it. On the other hand, because you are much more specific, you can save a lot of space and time because Python itself needs to know about each integer what is its size and who knows what happens and when it grows and all of these things. And Python is flexible and that's why we use it. NumPy on the other hand, this extension, it needs this specific thing. So you would say integer eight bit, and then it can put the, all the data in a very compact place and do much faster calculations on it. Something like a hundred times faster, or I don't know thousand times faster, so it's worth it, okay? Now, why is this 88 bit and 32 bit? So a bit can represent zero and one. So eight bits, if you using the binary representation model, can represent numbers between zero and 255. So if in your data set, all of the numbers are in this set, in this range, then you would be able to use int eight. Okay, because, and then you could put a lot more data in your memory. So in the end, you have some memory in the computer and that's, if you, if you use int eight, then you can put a lot more of these pieces into it. On the other hand, if you use 832, because you, your data is still small numbers, but you didn't care, then now you wasted like 32, uh, the, the rest, like what, whatever, 24 bits. Okay, because you actually used only the eight, but you allocated the 32 in the memory for each one. Of course, if your data has large uh, integers, then you will need to use the in 32. Okay, and I think there's also in 16 and various, and for float you have 32 and 64 bit. So in the end, you it's a trade-off. Okay, how much memory you use, uh, what kind of data you can contain, uh, you can uh, store in the memory or use uh, in your data. And then uh, the smaller the memory you use, the more data you can load and the faster actually the computation becomes because the, the computer doesn't have to go work on big numbers or think that it works on big, number, big numbers, okay? So, and there are lots of more in, in NumPy. So, that, that's it basically for now. I think we, we, it's better that we, we stop now and we get back to the, the rest of this chapter um, in the next video, right? Okay, so any questions? Any more questions here? No, I think this was straightforward. Okay, so let me try to find it. Stop recording here, okay. So see you next time. See ya.